This week, a journey up the Amazon, or three. Over the centuries, many searches for legendary cities of gold have in more recent times, through archaeological findings, become transformed into solid history. But our story today is about a legendary personality, one Percy H. Fawcett, a colonel in the British Army who was also an explorer and an adventurer, who harboured a passionate belief that he could find El Dorado in the Amazon basin. He wasn't the first European, nor the last, to follow the dream of the city of gold. But perhaps he got the closest. We may never know, because in 1925, he and his party of explorers disappeared into the jungle, never to be seen again. But there's been a revival of interest in what happened to Fawcett and his party. In today's feature, history and legend come together in a strange and beguiling saga, presented for hindsight by Tony Barrell. The Fawcett Saga The Perfect Kingdom and the Hero of Gold A Search for a Place That Never Was and the truth beneath. I was sitting in the back seat of a four-wheel drive Mitsubishi truck, fiddling with a global positioning system. We were heading north. Paolo had told me that we would need a powerful truck this is the worst time of year, he said. The roads are, how do you say in English, shit. After a while, a plateau came into view, an endless tabletop that reached into the clouds. We stopped at its base and Paolo said, come, I show you something. What sort of a country is this that is unknown to all the world and in which nature has everywhere so different an appearance to what she has in ours? Possibly this is that part of the globe where everywhere is right, for there must certainly be some such place. Candide, Voltaire, 1759. Where are we going, I asked Paolo. You Americans are always impatient, he said. He helped to pull me up a ledge, and as I got to my feet, covered in mud, he pointed at another ridge a few yards away and said, Now you see. Jutting into the sky was a cracked stone column. In fact, there was not just one, but several columns in a row, as in a Greek ruin. What is it, I asked. Stone City, Paolo said. Who built it? It is, how do you say, an illusion. It was made by nature, by erosion, Paolo said, but many people who see it think it is a lost city. In front of what Greeks call the Pillars of Heracles, there lay an island which was larger than Libya and Asia together, and it was possible for the travellers of that time to cross from it to the other islands and from the islands to the whole of the continent which encompasses that veritable ocean. Now in this island of Atlantis, there existed a confederation of kings, of great and marvellous power, which held sway over all the island, and over many other islands also, and parts of the continent. Plato, Timaeus, 360 BC. He was in the right place, but he was looking for the wrong thing. He was quite explicit that what he expected to find was stone cities, cobbled streets, an alphabetic system, draft animals. I mean, he was wrong. Yes, he was. This Fawcett, Colonel Percy H. Fawcett. Explorer, cartographer, spy, crackpot, maybe. But he did something that was brave as well as crazy. And when he disappeared in 1925, looking for his lost city of Zed, the world, well, Europe, or rather Britain, was stunned. Fawcett's biographer is David Gran, who, like hundreds of people, followed his tracks into the Amazon basin. But unlike a lot of them, David lived to tell the tale. 
My name is David Grant. I'm a writer at the New Yorker magazine, and I'm the author of the book, The Lost City of Z. Now, that's very interesting. Straight away, we have to tackle the problem of whether or not we call it Z or Z. Colonel Fawcett might have called it Z, but I think you that, call it Z, don't you? That's, that's right. He would have called it Z, wouldn't he? <laughs> Why did this mysterious Colonel Fawcett become such a celebrity and a mystery? Even in his day, before he disappeared, he was a legend. He was really the last of the kind of great Victorian and Edwardian explorers who would venture into blank spots on the map, pretty much just a machete and an almost divine sense of purpose. And he had begun exploring the Amazon in 1906, uh, mapping the interior, and he explored it up until 1925. And stories of his adventures really captivated the public's imagination. Uh, he helped inspire Conan Doyle's novel, The Lost World. During his explorations, he began to gather evidence that led him to believe there was an ancient civilization in the middle of the jungle. And in 1925, he set out to find it, and he brought with him uh, just two people, his son, uh, Jack, who was 21 years old, and his son's best friend, and then they disappeared uh, without a trace. And this only added and kind of fueled the legend, the mystery, and people began to plunge into the jungle uh, to try to find out what happened to him and also whether this ancient civilization, this place he called simply Z, uh, really existed. He became an explorer through the auspices of the Royal Geographical Society in London. How did that happen? The Royal Geographical Society was really engaged in kind of one of these great projects of kind of mapping the world. Many of the Royal Geographical Explorers tried to map some of the interior of Australia. They had helped sponsor such expeditions as Burton and Livingston, and he was really the teal end of this. And they essentially taught him how to map and how to survey, and they also taught him how to survive in the jungle. And I read many of the manuals that Fawcett was given, and they showed just basically how barbaric these expeditions were. They would tell him, for example, that if he was hit by a poisonous arrow, to take gunpowder and pack it into the wound and ignite it. They would tell you if you're bitten by a poisonous snake, to pour boiling grease into it. And his first mission actually was to be a spy. He went to Northern Africa, where he helped spy for the empire. And then after that, he went to uh, the Amazon, which was really kind of the last large blank space on the map. And because of the impenetrable jungle and the difficult conditions and the diseases, uh, it had remained this last kind of impenetrable spot. And it was so unknown in the early 1900s that the countries of Bolivia, Peru, and Brazil, they didn't even know where the borders were in the interior. And so they had asked Fawcett to come and help map them. There occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, the island of Atlantis disappeared in the depths of the sea. Okay, this is uh, Michael Heckenberger. I'm an associate professor at the University of Florida in the Department of Anthropology, and I work with indigenous people and their histories, including the archaeological history of indigenous people in the Amazon basin. Were you at all interested or influenced by the exploration into this area that you've been working in by Colonel P.H. Fawcett? I actually had heard the stories of Fawcett, not so much his lost cities, but the expeditions that had been mounted to try and find out where he disappeared. I read Fawcett's material, but I thought he was uh, quite a bit off track in what he was looking for. Following in the footsteps of Fawcett was the farthest thing from my mind. In 1911, uh, an archeologist named Hiram Bingham discovered Machu Picchu. And at the time, this is before radiocarbon dating or anything, there was no clear certainty as what these ancient stone towns in the Andes were dated to. And Fawcett looked at some of those ancient stone towns and thought that they were older than, for instance, the Egyptian pyramids, that these were very ancient settlements. And um, I think got it in his head that we should find similar things in the Amazon basin. And that's where he expected to find what he fundamentally felt was a satellite of Atlantis. I mean, he was wrong. Where did he get his ideas about Atlantis from? Well, it's another kind of forlorn 
dream, I guess, of the Western imagination that there are these these satellites of Atlantis or where Atlantis itself was located. And so it's kind of like El Dorado. Um, there's a there's a place in the Western imagination for uh, these places existing somewhere. And the Amazon in the 1920s, when Fawcett was looking, was one of the last unknown areas. And so he kind of perpetuates this dream of finding something like El Dorado or Atlantis out there in the middle of the Amazon and that you would find these completely unknown lost civilizations. There once existed in the Atlantic Ocean opposite the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea a large island which was the remnant of an Atlantic continent and known to the ancient world as Atlantis. The description of this island given by Plato is not, as has been long supposed, fable, but veritable history. In 1882, when Percy Fawcett was 15, Ignatius L. Donnelly published a book which opened the Victorian world to the idea that Atlantis was a civilization which once joined Europe to the Americas. In the course of ages, a populous and mighty nation arose whose overflowings populated the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River, the Amazon, the Pacific coast of South America, the Mediterranean, the west coast of Europe and Africa, the Baltic, the Black Sea and the Caspian. Ignatius L. Donnelly, Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, 1882. He basically took his descriptions straight out of classic descriptions of what Atlantis would have looked like. A lost city, but a continent full of treasure. Gold is the most exquisite of all things. Whoever possesses gold can acquire all that he desires in the world. Truly, for with gold, he can gain entrance for his soul into paradise. Christopher Columbus, San Salvador, 1492. The search for gold was accelerated by the legend of El Dorado, which many European explorers brought back with them including the English adventurer, Walter Raleigh. The stories came from many sources, but there was one eyewitness who actually saw that El Dorado was not a city of gold, but a man. The ceremony took place on the appointment of a new ruler. They made a raft of rushes, all loaded with an infinity of men and women, dressed in fine plumes, golden plaques and crowns, they stripped the royal heir to his skin and anointed him with a sticky earth on which they placed gold dust so that he was completely covered with this metal. Juan Rodriguez Troxo, 1638. Would he have been aware of the El Dorado myth? Was that still current in the early part of the 20th century in Britain? Around 1910 or not, you know, about four years uh, of, after his experience of being in the jungle, he began to investigate the legend much more intently. Uh, not something he just heard, but he actually went and dug up a lot of the old chronicles that were written by the first El Dorado hunters, those conquistadores who had arrived uh, originally in Peru uh, in the early 1500s and were told by Indians of a story of a great civilization in the jungle that was supposedly so wealthy that the king would essentially paint his body in golden powder and he would gleam in the sun. Uh, El Dorado literally means the gilded man. And he began to study a lot of these early texts and chronicles of the early El Dorado explorers to see if they might contain clues uh, to a real ancient civilization, not something that was just a figment of the imagination. And Fawcett's belief that there was a civilization yet undiscovered in the middle of the jungle, uh, he believed would be an even more important discovery. At his feet they placed a great heap of gold and emeralds for him to offer to his god. The gilded Indian then threw out a pile of gold into the middle of the lake, and the chiefs who had accompanied him did the same. And as the raft moved towards the shore, the shouting began again, with pipes, flutes and large teams of singers and dancers. With this ceremony, 
the new ruler was received and was recognized as Lord and King. But 90 years before Troxell wrote about the Golden Man, the conquistadores had seen something for themselves on the banks of the Amazon. They were looking for El Dorado, but found something real. But very little has been heard of it since Colonel Percy Fawcett disappeared, until recently, when Michael Heckenberger, David Gran, and then the National Geographic Company went looking for what Fawcett might have found before he disappeared. This is how National Geographic promoted its finding. In 1542, Spanish conquistador Francisco de Orellana led an expedition into the Amazon in search of a lost civilization and its fabulous city of gold, El Dorado. Conquistadors are really driven by greed, uh, by lust for gold. And uh, the first El Dorado expedition had some 4,000 men who went, they climbed over the Andes, plunged into the jungle, and some 4,000 men died on that expedition alone. Captain Oriana volunteered to lead an advance party to find food downriver. They were the first Europeans to transcend and go down uh, the Amazon River. Orellana claimed to have made one of the greatest discoveries in history. That the Amazon was teeming with a sophisticated civilization, living in large walled cities, managing the jungle like a farm. We would never know the details of the incredible story if it were not for the writings of a Dominican priest. What I shall tell from here on will be as an eyewitness and as a man to whom God chose to give a part in such a strange and hitherto never experienced voyage of discovery. Father Gaspar de Carvajal kept a journal as the survivors drifted down the Amazon. Captain Orellana picked out 57 men with whom we proceeded down the river with the idea that if and when food was found, we would turn back and join the main party, all of which turned out the reverse, because we did not find food for a distance of 200 leagues, a league being three miles or nearly five kilometers. And so we kept on going to follow the river and either die or see what there was along it. As well as descriptions of battles, there are detailed passages of the people and customs of a huge indigenous population. On New Year's Day, 1542, it seemed to some of our companions that they heard Indian drums. But as neither that day nor the next was any inhabited country actually seen, it became evident that it was a matter of pure imagination. But on the 8th of January, while eating certain forest roots, drums were heard again, very plainly. But it was the captain who heard them first, and announced it to the company. And so we knew that we were entering inhabited country, and would no longer die of hunger. Fawcett was not after gold. I mean, he certainly coveted fame and he wanted to be known as a legendary explorer, and that certainly motivated him, even though he was an amateur archaeologist and an amateur scientist, and he really was driven by this kind of deep scientific curiosity. He also was motivated to prove that he was right, because many people cast aspersions on his theory that the jungle could have really contained such a place. By the time Fawcett was exploring, notions of El Dorado were simply considered fantasies or delusions. And so that Fawcett believed that he was determined to prove that he was right. And those were really the driving forces that sent him off into the jungle. An Indian overlord named Aparia informed us of the existence of wealth further down the river and of another overlord far inland who possessed very great wealth in gold. Never did we get to see him because he kept far from where we were on the river. 
And did you have any idea what you were really looking for? What I originally was looking for was an area where there was fairly clear evidence of pre-Columbian societies, where there were still indigenous people, and where there was fairly clear indication that the two were genetically related. The indigenous people who live in the Amazon today had undergone over the past few centuries significant depopulation and uh, cultural disintegration related to European colonialism. And so what we were trying to do is we were trying to map out the histories of these peoples and see if in fact we could register what was the scale and the nature of the settlements there around 1500 AD. The priest also records glimpses of even larger civilizations inland. Such large populations would have had to produce a lot of food to sustain themselves. A feat that scientists in the last century thought was impossible due to the acidic soil. But new science indicates that the ancient Indians had found a solution. They were making their own soil. Below the lush crops, a thick blanket of black fertile soil six feet deep covers the entire site. We came to more settlements from where the Indians gave us much food and the next day we went down river in sight of several fair villages and there came to see the captain four Indians and they were of such a stature that each was taller by a hand span than the tallest Christian and they came all decked in gold and splendid attire and with them they brought much food and told the captain they were vassals of a very great overlord and in May we arrived in the provinces of Machiparo, another great overlord, whose headquarters was on a small hill close to the river, from where he held sway over many settlements and very large ones, which together contribute 50,000 warriors. To some degree, the idea of urbanism in any form in the Amazon comes as a great shock to people. Very soon after we got there, we realized the people who live there today are the direct descendants of pre-Columbian ancestors in the area. In pre-Columbian times, the communities were much larger, but they were also networked together through these complex road systems, 10 or 15 times as large as contemporary villages. And the density of them in the same area was significantly greater as well. There was 10 or 15 times as many settlements. It took two days and nights to get through the territory of the great overlord Machiparo, which extended for 80 leagues. And there was one settlement, which alone stretched for five leagues without any intervening space from house to house, which was a marvelous thing to behold. Other than these relatively rare early chronicles of exploration, there's not a lot of historical documentation of Amazonian societies. So we have a fairly big gap until natural historians and people who were looking to explore the region for resources in the 19th and 20th century appear. And by then the region was very different. There had in fact in the Amazon basin, like in other parts of the Americas, the disintegration of a lot of these indigenous complex societies. And so what people ran into in the 19th and 20th century was small, isolated communities in the forest that seemed autonomous. In this village, there was a villa in which there was a great deal of porcelain, both jars and pitchers and plates and bowls, all glazed and embellished with drawings and paintings on them, so accurately worked that they looked like Roman artifacts. And the Indians told us there was as much gold and silver in the country as there was clay. And from this village, there were many roads and fine highways to the inland country. And we had not gone but half a league when we came upon a royal highway. But the captain decided to turn back to the river because it was getting dark and it was not wise to sleep the night in a land so thickly populated. What we did not find were settlements with large stone architecture. In a lot of parts of the Amazon, it's hard to find a single stone. Would you call them cities? 
what we've found and, and to some degree what we were looking for is very different than what most people have in mind when they think of cities. Um, but what we did find is we found that these relatively large prehistoric communities were tied into fairly precisely laid out networks of towns and villages. The largest settlements probably had a thousand, maybe two thousand people. A central community and then four kind of nodes, each of them fairly large towns, fairly closely spaced together. And they were connected by a very precisely laid out system of roads. And so what we've found, and, and to some degree what we were looking for, is very different than what most people have in mind when they think of cities. Now, with that said, there was dozens, potentially, of these clusters within the same cultural system in the Upper Shingu Basin. So when we speak of regional populations, we're looking at populations that are well into the tens of thousands. It may have ranged up to 50,000 or more people. And they were doing some very sophisticated things. It was probably a heavily managed agricultural landscape. It was based on manioc agriculture and also fish farming. And so the overall landscape was a mosaic landscape surrounded by a kind of a green belt of forested areas. I've used the term garden cities to refer to them. The Oriana party eventually reached the mouth of the Amazon in August 1542 and sailed on to Spain where Carvajal wrote the story of their adventures. However, over the passing centuries, the population of the city villages they saw was depleted by murder, slavery and disease. And by the time Carvajal's account appeared in English in 1894, the Amazon was once more a vast black space infested by ranchers, woodcutters and prospectors, and the indigenous people had retreated into the jungle, which soon covered over the remains of their ancestors' civilization, a mystery waiting to be rediscovered. What I have written is the truth throughout. God be praised. Amen. Caspar de Cavajal, 1542. The vast interior of the Amazon remained unexplored until quite recently. In 1925, British explorer Colonel Percy Fawcett led an expedition into an uncharted region of the Brazilian Amazon to find what he called the Lost City of Z. Our destination, I call it Z is a city reputed to be inhabited. At first, there seemed little evidence of the inland civilization that Captain Oriana glimpsed. I hope these chapters will make it clear what I'm looking for. But as the expedition continued further into the jungle, Fawcett met tribes that impressed him greatly. And why Zed is my chief objective. He was fascinated by their legends, more clues that might lead him to Z. The existence of the old cities, I don't for a moment doubt. What Fawcett did is that he arrived uh, in Rio and then he went to Sao Paulo. He took a train to the frontier of the Amazon, uh, which was kind of the way you would imagine. It was kind of like the Wild West frontier, uh, kind of the early settlements in the Mato Grosso region. And then he took a, a boat up a river up to Cuiaba, which was the capital of the state of Mato Grosso. And then he set out with about a dozen uh, pack animals uh, moving northward and then eventually into the Xingu area. And the Xingu is a southern tributary of the Amazon. It's one of its largest southern tributaries. And that was the region in which he was heading in the jungle. In previous years, Fawcett had gone out with a big party, dozens of men, all paid for by the Royal Geographical Society. But they weren't interested in the city of Zed. So the 1925 search was Fawcett light. With him was his eldest son, Jack, and his friend, Raleigh. They only had a few pack animals and native bearers, not many guns and little ammunition, 
and a strong belief, by foresaid anyway, that if they did the right thing, they would be fed rather than killed by the local tribes. For Fawcett, this was the last chance to prove something big. Unfortunately, I cannot induce scientific men to accept even the supposition that there are traces of an old civilization in Brazil. If my journey isn't successful, my work in South America ends in failure. I must be inevitably discredited as a visionary, branded as one who had only personal enrichment in view. Who will ever understand? I want no glory from it. The last few years have been the most wretched and disillusioning in my life, full of anxieties, uncertainties, financial stringency, underhand dealing and outright treachery. I'm doing it unpaid in the hope that its ultimate benefit to mankind will justify the years spent in the quest. The last reports that Fawcett made suggested that the expedition was not going well. The attempt to write is fraught with much difficulty, owing to the legion of flies that pester one. The worst of the tiny ones, smaller than the pinhead, almost invisible, but stinging like a mosquito. We go on with eight mules. Their mules were starving. The Brazilian guides and native porters had left. Jack is getting stronger by the day, but I myself am bitten or stung by ticks. Our route will be from Dead Horse Camp, 11 degrees 43 minutes south and 54 degrees 35 minutes west, where my horse died in 1921. Then to the high ground between the states of Goiás and Bahia, a region quite unknown and said to be infested with savages, but where I expect to get some trace of the inhabited cities. He had the paranoia of a spy, and he had been a spy, and he was always afraid that one of his rivals might beat him to his discovery. And he actually sent out dispatches on his trip, uh, written accounts as he was heading into the jungle. He would give these to uh, Indian runners or others, and they would be carried out of the jungle. It would take them weeks to reach an outpost, and then eventually they would be typed up on telegraph machines, and they were blasted around the world. So the people were actually following this expedition uh, in real time. Um, but precisely where Fawcett was going uh, in the Mato Grosso region was always mysterious. He had released a few coordinates uh, for a camp called Dead Horse Camp to be the only known coordinates of where Fawcett had gone in the jungle. And one of the things I discovered in my research when I tracked down one of Fawcett's private diaries and logbooks was that those coordinates that he had released to the public were really a ruse to throw his rivals off the trail. We're at Dead Horse Camp, the spot where my horse died in 1921. Only his white bones remain. Yeah, I mean, it was a very bare bones expedition. Fawcett had a theory that uh, the only way to survive was to take very small parties which could live off the land and would also be able to persuade uh, tribes that they were not hostile. And if you took a larger armed party, uh, you were more likely to get massacred. Now this was very counterintuitive and, and people thought that Fawcett uh, was somewhat mad for taking such a small party on such a dangerous trip. It's very cold at night, but the insects and heat come by midday. And from then till six o'clock in the evening, it's sheer misery. But you need have no fear of any failure. He had made contact with many tribes in the regions that have previously uh, been uncontacted, and he would document their legends and listen to their legends uh, to find evidence uh, about their uh, earlier ancestors, uh, which suggested that there had once been much larger populations, larger settlements in the jungle. One of the theories about the jungle was that the soil was very depleted, and so it was actually very hard to go crops. And so one of the theories that archaeologists and anthropologists in the 20th century believe was that even though you think of the Amazon as this kind of place of abundant food, uh, in fact, um, it was very hard to find food to actually support a large population, which would be a 
precursor to a complex society. Well, Fawcett was always struck when he stayed with various indigenous communities and that food problems were never something that actually bothered them. Conditions were extremely difficult. The most dangerous predator was the mosquitoes, which would transport everything from malaria to yellow fever to elephantiasis, bone crusher fever. This was really one of the greatest risks. What they were most afraid of was the black vomit, uh, which was kind of spitting up these mouthfuls of blood, which meant the end was near and death was likely. And Fawcett and his party had a strict rule that because they were going to such difficult areas, the rule was that you could not carry a person out. And so if a person became too weak or too sick, uh, they agreed beforehand that they would have to be abandoned. We hope to get through the region in a few days. Jack is well and fit. As for me, I'm still being devoured by ticks. Riley, I'm anxious about, but he won't go back. Fawcett had warned that he might be out of contact uh, for a while, but a year passed and then two explorers began to plunge into the jungle determined to try to solve what has been described as really the greatest exploration mystery of the 20th century. Many of these expeditions died of disease and starvation. Uh, others were killed by hostile tribes. And then there were those that simply disappeared along with Fawcett. You mean people looking for him disappeared looking for him? That's exactly right. In 1928, when the first expedition, uh, what major expedition went to search for Fawcett, was led by a man named Commander Diary. And tens of thousands of people volunteered to go with him from all walks of lives. The expeditions continued all the way into the present. In 1996, a major Brazilian expedition went. Another father uh, who took a son with him, a 16-year-old boy, and uh, they headed off into the jungle and they were uh, kidnapped uh, by a tribe and held in captivity uh, for several days before escaping. Uh, one of the other things that was always hard for me to understand was his decision to take his son with him on a journey where death was so uh, likely. Fawcett is often a very polarizing figure and people either tend to either just romanticize him or just see him as a kind of a mad crank. And prior to World War I, who was very much scientifically grounded, very pragmatic, uh, very much came out of the Royal Geographic Society and its ethos. By the end of his life, his obsession with finding this place and his retreat uh, especially after the war, from what he considered in many ways the collapse and just the brutality of Western civilization, led him almost into a delirium. And I think by the very end of his life, where he certainly didn't believe in UFOs, uh, his writings are filled with kind of mystical, um, almost fantastical descriptions. The building between Zed and the point where we leave civilization is described by the Indians as a sort of fat tower of stone. They're thoroughly scared of it because they say at night a light shines from doors and windows. I suspect this to be the so-called light that never goes out. Another reason for their fear is that it stands in the territory of the troglodyte people who live in pits, caves and sometimes in thickly foliaged trees. The city, say the Indians, had low stone walls, some big buildings, and a great temple in which was a large disc cut out of rock crystal. One thing is certain. Between the outer world and the secrets of ancient South America, a veil has descended. And it's interesting because Fawcett began his career very much trying to dispel the mythology, to peel back the blank spaces, to, to map it, to charter it, to document it, to show what was real. And by the end, his writings were almost a retreat back uh, to pre-science. There are streaks of delirium and even madness to him. By the time Percy Fawcett arrived here, there was almost nothing left of the ancient Indian cities. Some called it El Dorado, others the city of Zen. Now the doomed dreamers have been proved right. There was a great civilization. New satellite imagery has revealed more than 200 huge geometric earthworks carved in the upper Amazon basin. 
Spanning 250 kilometers, the circles, squares, and other geometric shapes form a network of avenues, ditches, and enclosures. Scientists believe there may be as many as another 2,000 structures beneath the jungle canopy. David Gran, author of The Lost City of Zed, says, These revelations are exploding our perception of what the Americas really looked like before the arrival of Christopher Columbus. The Guardian, January 2010. So there were ancient cities. There is no question that the evidence gathered by archaeologists in the last decade strongly indicates uh, that the Amazon was home to much larger populations than previously uh, ever imagined, that there were enormous settlements and involved elaborate irrigation systems to be able to grow crops and to avoid the, the flooding, uh, that the Amazon really did uh, once contain ancient civilizations. I looked up at the tango trees and creepers around me, and at the biting flies and mosquitoes that left streaks of blood on my skin. I had lost my guide. I was out of food and water. Putting the map back in my pocket, I pressed forward, trying to find my way out as branches snapped in my face. Then I saw something moving in the trees. Who's there? I called. There was no reply. A figure flitted among the branches, and then another. They were coming closer, and for the first time I asked myself, what the hell am I doing here? You went looking for Fawcett more than 80 years after, so what made you go there? Gradually I became myself the thing I thought I would never be, which was a Fawcett freak, and I began to gather details. I went around the world searching in archives and libraries. Eventually I had gone to Cardiff, Wales, where I tracked down Fawcett's granddaughter. Then she said, well, do you really want to know what happened to my grandfather? And I said, you know, well, sure, if at all possible. And she'd led me into a room where there was an old chest and she'd open up the chest and inside were these books and they're covered in dust and the bindings were breaking apart. And I said, well, what are those? And she said, well, those are my grandfather's log books and diaries. And she let me go through them. And these really held enormous clues, both to the mystery of Fawcett's life, but also to the mystery of his death and the coordinates of where he really went in the jungle, something that had always been a mystery. And it was really at that point that I decided to do something foolish and head off into the jungle myself. I could not be more different. <laughs> um, you know, I am the least likely explorer and I'm out of shape. And, you know, I take the elevator rather than climb the stairs. And I'm very much of a New York City kid. So we were extraordinarily different. And I found Fawcett an extremely complicated character. There was things about him I deeply admired. Uh, he was extraordinarily brave. He was fearless. He had a wonderful curiosity about the world. Um, and then there were other things about him that I found very hard to relate to. He could be merciless uh, to his companions who were weaker. He really didn't have much sympathy or compassion for weaker men. He didn't understand it. And anything that stood in the way of his ob object or slowed him down, he had contempt for. He embodies all these contradictions. He was raised in the Victorian era. He was brought up as part of the empire. He was originally set out to help defend and preserve the empire. And he kind of maintained, even throughout his life, uh, many of those attitudes of the superiority uh, of Great Britain. And yet, when he was in the jungle, he was always struck by the complexity and the sophisticated nature of many of these uh, uh, indigenous communities. And so he, his life was always trying to reconcile these theories he had been taught with the reality uh, in which he existed. And one of the ways he was able to survive was by adapting many of the indigenous uh, methods of hunting and medicine. He took a lot of herbs. Uh, by the end of his life, he essentially painted his face like an Indian warrior and lived in the jungle as such. From my point of view, Fawcett was inspired, no doubt about it, if not obsessed in finding a lost city, but he would have been disappointed because he was truly looking for the wrong thing. It just so happens that working in the same area and finding these complex settlement patterns, very quickly people latched onto these as lost cities of the Amazon. And to some degree, I've pitched the argument of these settlement patterns as, well, why not? So there's a certain inescapable connection with Percy Fawcett. 
and his search for lost cities of the Amazon and what our discoveries have led us to conclude. You need have no fear of any failure. His last words, May the 29th, 1925. From Exploration Fawcett, published in 1953 and edited by Fawcett's son, Brian. The Fawcett Saga was written and produced by Tony Barrow. The sound engineer was Louis Mitchell. Taking part were David Gran and Michael Heckenberger. Readings by Tony Baldwin and Andrew McLennan. The National Geographic trailer for the TV series Lost Cities of the Amazon featured the voice of Peter Coyote. Thanks for recording facilities to WUFT Gainesville, Florida and studios of the Radio Foundation in New York. One knows whether Fawcett was killed or died of fever. Some people believe that he survived and went native. Others that he and the survivors of Atlantis are still in there somewhere. <laughs>